I'm going to um, just say something about Paul O'Connor, and he was co-convener of the left, um, the left movement, and he was writing in the Morning Star, and he refers to E.P. Thompson, a historian of the working class, and this was written in 1975. He said there were some sillies in the labour movement who didn't understand the nature of the EEC. As such, they thought that joining would facilitate advance and work advance working class interest. He pointed out joining the EEC would do the exact opposite and would put the capitalist class light years ahead of the working class. Today, the political heirs of these sinners have won the day within the Labour Party. Mm. Well, Arthur Scargill was active in 1975, <laughs> and he wasn't a silly then, and he acts a silly now. <laughs> now, um, the self-regarding blogger Guido Fawkes, um, actually, I think this is quite amusing, uh, Arthur wrote a letter to the Telegraph, and he was um, commenting on the uh, High Court, the um, Supreme Court, that made the judgment about um, you know, what was right and wrong. And um, interesting, because other people said, well, Supreme Court's only 11 years old. I think, um, was it David Starkey, a commentator, historian, he, he said, well, the, the other courts um, are hundreds of years old, and in British justice depends on precedent. <laughs> They've got hundreds of years precedent. I think the um, I think this started up. The Supreme Court started 11 years ago <laughs> under um, Blair, and uh, hasn't got much precedent. But anyway, if that wasn't um, itself biased, uh, certainly the people who took complaining about democracy um, were were pro Remain. Uh, they didn't take any democ didn't get, uh, take a de democratic problem about ignoring the referendum, did they? Um, anyway, the the thing about the outcome was, of, of this was that um, uh, Guido Fawkes writes and saying, um, well, the the, 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 mail, uh, the um, mail did first uh, uh, wrote to say that Arthur Scargill was uh, an unlikely. Um, Comrade to to Johnson to Boris Johnson, <laughs> and so Guido thought that uh, well, as um, people get older, they turn right right, and this is a good example of it. But I think the interesting thing about this is there were over, uh, over forty comments, and there wasn't one that agreed with Guido Falls. People, Arthur Scargill turning right, getting <laughs> mad and. You know, other people making similar comments and, and supporting that. So uh, I think that uh, Guido Fawkes fell on his face. And if anybody can um, tell me after tonight and uh, after speaking that there's been any change from, well, 75, before 75, Arthur has kept his principles then, now, and will continue. Arthur Scarborough. Comrade Chairman, comrades, I first became involved in the fight against the European state when I was 16 years of age. You'll gather from my age, that's over 60 years ago. With the Treaty of Paris, it was wrong then, it's wrong now. The aim, sponsored by the way, by the United States, the right wing of the Labour Party in Britain, was to create a United States of Europe with an army. It wanted to see states like this subjected not merely to one or another policy, but to the entire policy determined by unelected representatives of capitalism. Take, for example, the point that was made, I think, by Eddie about taxation. VAT is a European tax. VAT is an inquisitive tax tax. It's a tax which punishes working people. First of all, can it be right 
that two people go to a shop and are charged the same amount of tax for the goods that are being produced. Because that is what VAT does. The taxation policy we should have is as simple as A, B, C. Actually, the Labour government of 45, 51 introduced it with a top band of 90%. Let me tell you how we could do something for the National Health Service, for education, for social services, for care for the elderly. 1% increase in taxation would bring in £6 billion pounds a year. I'll tell you what, why don't we say 4% and clear the debt and renationalise entirely our National Health Service and get rid of all these thieves who have taken away that created. I remember in 1975 I took part in the campaign to leave the European Economic Community, the common market. By the way, the people didn't vote to go in. It was Ted Heath who took us in. <laughs> and we fought to take Britain out. It's an interesting bunch. So real left wingers here. Barbara Castle. Yep. Tony Benn. John MacDonald. Peter Shaw. All of those, including Jeremy Corbyn. I spoke with them all in 75, fighting for withdrawal from the European Economic Community. For as long as I've been involved in politics, the leadership of the Labour Party now, and I'm talking about Jeremy Corbyn, who's been a friend of mine for 40 years, have fought against every single treaty. The Treaty of Paris, the Treaty of Rome, the Treaty of Maastricht, the Treaty of Amsterdam, the Treaty of Rome, and of course, the Treaty of Lisbon. All of those treaties engulf this nation and its people in an image. You're not only just control over one segment of the economy, you are determined by what they say you should do or should not do. I'm like Eddie of Irish descent, but I also know the value of growing your own goods or becoming self-sufficient. If anyone ever told us something that was right, it was Gandhi when he said, home spun, let's produce our own salt, let's produce our own cotton, when the British said they mustn't do it. In other words, why is it that we still import into this country services and goods that we could produce here. Before we joined the EC or the European Union, we produced 80% of our own food. Today, it's 59%. In Yorkshire, where I come from, surrounded by fields, and the farmer says, I'm being paid not to grow goods. He's being paid not to grow. But he's also being paid to grow willow trees in order to chop them down and then saw them up and send them to a power station to burn them. So we lose, first of all, the facility of taking in carbon dioxide and turning it into oxygen and then when we cut them down, we lose it again by going to a power station to burn it. And then they talked about the coal industry which they effectively destroyed. Incidentally, the Treaty of Paris was designed to destroy the European coal industry. And it did just that. The merger, for example, of East and West Germany that was hailed 
when they knocked down the wall, systematically destroyed the East German coal industry. And as uh, speakers have said tonight, the firms in the European Union are the ones who are in pressure, under pressure. They want some kind of a deal. I want no deal. I don't want anything to do with the European Union. And the sooner we get out, the better. What baffles me in the Labour movement is the lack of understanding that under Article 50, and you've heard that many times, subsection 1 would have allowed us to walk away the day after the referendum in 2016 because we don't have a written constitution. That's all we had to do, walk away. And then if any company wanted to trade, we could trade with them. And what we could say to them is, if you're going to bring goods and services into this country, and you're going to produce those goods with slave labour or child labour, they're not coming in. And any goods that you do bring in will be subject to a tariff imposed by us and not by you. Just imagine the situation. We collect a tax for the European Union and give it to them. How balmy can we get? But that's the reality of it. And you know, we're, wit we're witnessing a monumental betrayal. Every speaker tonight, in one form or another, has said that same point. Who would have thought that a lifelong campaigner against the European Union, Jeremy Corbyn, would now be saying, we've got to stay in the European Union, we've got to have a customs union, a single market, and that means the so-called free movement of labour and capital. Well, the free movement of labour and capital is a myth. There's no such thing. What happens is it's highly controlled. You have a situation where companies in this country can see their dis destruction on one simple principle. Is it in their interest, not workers? I spoke up in Scotland when they were closing a, co a company operated by Volvo. And I did a big meeting outside the gates. There were hundreds there. And television were there. And scribes from the media. You know, the people who tell us the truth. <laughs> like Channel 4. <laughs> the weather tonight's been very bad. It's due to Brexit. I mean, every time they speak, it's Brexit. But outside this plant, I'm appealing to the crowd. And I said, you know, these people's livelihoods are at stake. And yet, in there, there's a managing director who didn't come out to face me. But the silly bugger did. He went to the platform. So I said, what an opportunity. I said, now tell me this. Is this plan economic? He said, yes. Don't forget it's been filmed. I said, two. Is the workforce a good workforce? He says, first class. I said, is it profitable? He says, extremely. I said, so could you tell the workers here, why is it that you're moving the plant to Poland? Oh, he says, that's simple. He said, he said, we can pay five times less in wages to them than we had to win here. That's what you call freedom of capital. It's the same as Alex was saying. When they move people into Britain, don't confuse it with immigration and migration. The two things are different. As far as I'm concerned, people who are genuine immigrants, particularly from former Commonwealth countries, 
genuine immigrants who were seeking asylum from terror and problems all over the world should have a welcome here. But that's not the problem. The problem is the migrant labour that's been forcibly, economically brought into Britain. I remember in the 1950s, they were closing down the Italian coal industry in line with the Treaty of Paris. And they wanted to move all their miners to Britain. And the miners' union said no. As far as we are concerned, we'll stand four square in defence of the jobs that we have, not as ours, but we hold in trust for our sons and our daughters and our grandchildren. And that must be right. What a situation when we calculate in terms of what we have now rather than look to the future and future generations. Yes, we've got people in the environmental movement. Don't talk to me about that. I was a leader of the environmental movement before they were born. I was alongside the leadership, arguing against nuclear power in all its forms, arguing for a sensible energy policy that will give free energy from solar power, hydroelectricity, power produced by power barrage as water comes in and water goes out like they have in France. And incidentally, while I'm on the subject, there was reference to the fact that uh, workers in France had been on strike, had a bit of an experience with that one. After the miners' strike in 84 85, I was invited to go to Paris and I was there as a visitor. And a colleague of mine said, Adieu, uh, Will you come with us today for a manifestateur? I thought, What's that? He said, It's demonstration. So I thought, well, of course I will, I'll be there. And I went along and there's 10,000 police all lined up. Well, you can imagine my, you know, arresting time in Britain. I said, Allah, I said, the police. Yes, they're on strike. I said, hang on. They're on strike. He said, yes, they're in our union. He said, will you go in? in uh, imagine, I'm, I'm marching in the front of 10,000 police and half a million workers from other industries in a demonstration for social rights. And we come up against what's called the CRS, the riot police. And suddenly, this lot charges that lot. I thought, is this where I step to one side and declare, you know what, I'm not really involved. How, how do you deal with people when they don't recognise your ballot result? Or they don't recognise your right to fight? I'll tell you how you do it. They do it like they did with the Tilbury dockers. They put them inside. And just for the education of anyone in here who doesn't understand what happened, I'll tell you. They went through the Court of Appeal. They even went through the House of Lords. That was before the Supreme Court. And they were told in no uncertain terms, you will be sent to prison for a very long time and there will be no appeal. And I remember Vic Turner from the West End, the East End of London, he told the story with Ricky Tomlinson there and me on the platform. He says, you know, one day he says, they said, you've got to come with us. The warden won't see you. So he said, we go to the warden's office. He says, and the warden's there like, and there's this funny bloke dressed in these funny breeches 
and a fluffy coat and a wig. He said it was a big stick. He said, uh, this is the official solicitor. <laughs> so Vic said, is he? I thought, have we got an increased sentence? He said, he went, I attend here on behalf of Her Majesty to tell ye, Vic, and he restarted their names, that I ask from this moment, ye shall be free. <laughs> she said, what's happening? Warden says, you, you can go. He said, we can go. She said, oh yeah. <laughs> Suddenly, they were walking free. Do you know what they were? They were under Supreme Court, under European Court. <laughs> It was the fact that a million people were on strike outside. That's what moved them. And that's what unmoved people in this country. If you want to know what we do now, it's take to the streets like they're doing and de demand that the people vote to respect it. I understand what the customs union is about and the single market. It's about controlling absolutely the economy of each individual as well as the collective. For example, what happens is this. If you've got an industry in trouble, like recently the steel industry in South Wales still is, they will not give permission to the British government to give an allowance or a subsidy to the steel industry to keep it going. Thomas Cook, which was a nationalised airline and a travel company, why didn't they simply take it back into nationalisation? I'll tell you why. The European Union. It won't allow it. The reason? Because, as previous speakers have said, they've got to go out for competition. Mm -hmm. Well, when you think about it, what happens then? Did you realise, or do you realise, that whilst they can't give you five billion or five million to keep the industry going and jobs secure, they can give you the same amount to close it. Now, if that's not the stupidity of economics, I don't understand the economics, and I think I do. <laughs> but that's the kind of price that we're paying in this country for belonging to the European Union. It is an organisation that's run by unelected bodies who dictate what we should or should not do. And every time they take a decision, we are impelled to do it and to undertake to put it into operation. There can be no doubt when you think about it just what damage is being done not only to this country but to other countries as well. There are very few net contributors. The German economy is in, mess, in a mess. The French are complaining not about that at the moment the complaining that they can't get elected their nominee in charge of industry at the European Union level. <laughs> That's all they're interested in. In other words, they're wanting to have a European Union that dictates every facet of your life. Well, just think about it. Just for a second, what can we do about it? Well, how can we change it? How can we alter it? Well, I'll tell you one thing we can't do, or not shouldn't do. <coughs> we shouldn't go along with the policies of the Labour Party at the moment that support remaining inside the European Union. We should oppose what they're saying as far as the customs union is concerned, the single market, and the so-called freedom of movement and capital. And I'll tell you where I stand. I urge every person in a general election 
to vote against any candidate who supports Remain in the European Common Market. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, beyond belief. Just look at it. It's been said we've got representative democracy in Britain. Well, just just look at the, the facts. Out of a total of 330 conservative constituencies, 249 voted to leave. 75%. Out of a total of 232 Labour constituencies. 148 voted to leave, 63%. Logically, in a representative democracy, that should have resulted in Parliament in an overwhelming vote to come out of the European Union the day after the referendum. Common sense tells you that if it's a representative democracy. And under Article 50, they could have done so without breaching anything. It's been done before. How many people understand in this country that there, there are at least three countries that have left the European Union? I'll just take one. Greenland. <coughs> Greenland was a member of the European Union. It was a, a, a Danish protectorate, but it was a member of the European Union. But they didn't like it. So they demanded a referendum. And they were threatened. They said in Brussels, listen, if you go for the referendum, your economy will be destroyed. You only have fish. <laughs> and we won't buy your fish. <laughs> and in spite of all their threats, these Greenlanders voted 80% to come out. And there's only been one interview on television, just one, three years ago, with the Prime Minister of Greenland. Yeah. And he was asked, I think the reporter got the sack, he said, <laughs> um, tell me, how has Greenland gone on since it left? Oh, fantastic. He said, well, now we have a difficulty in supplying everybody who wants our fish. <laughs> he said, but our biggest market is in the European Union. <laughs> in other words, they, they were kidding. <laughs> St. Bartholomew, a French colony, that also left in 2007. Not many people know that, do they? <laughs> it's going along all right. There's two other countries lined up, want to go, but they're resisting them at the moment. And of course, Algeria left. They left when they became independent. Now if they can leave, and they can leave not as a, a result of a referendum apart from Greenland, and they can leave just by saying we're going, why the hell couldn't we say the same thing and just go? It seems to me to be common sense that that is what should happen. <coughs> now, the question at tonight's meeting is, what do we do? Where do we go? Well, first of all, we do all we can to put pressure on a Labour Party that's betrayed every single one of us in the working class. And we also do it as far as the trade union movement's concerned in the DUC. Don't forget, in 1983, the Labour Party manifesto gave a commitment to come out of the European Union. So what happened? The leadership of the party were in favour. It wasn't just Tony Benn. It wasn't just Michael Ford. It was the whole party who voted to come out. And suddenly, there's a complete reversal. And the people who are inside the organisation are real committed, aren't they, on the left? when you look at them. They think nothing about leaving, first of all, to set up their own party. And then on the other hand, that's not going anywhere, so they join the Liberal Democrats. And that's not going anywhere either. <laughs> but the one that takes the biscuit for me is Nicola. <laughs> I, she's a girl, you know. I'm telling you. 
she wants independence for Scotland. And what, I, 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 as I'll have to quote, I want independence for Scotland now. And I tell you this, oh, when we get independence from, from England, oh, we get independence for Scotland, we'll build, we'll build a border. She doesn't want a border in Ireland, but she wants a border in Scotland. But to top it all, when they get independence, and that's up to them, she then wants to give it away to the European Union. <laughs> if I were her, I should go for some treatment. <laughs> you know, we should learn that we can produce all those things that people have talked about. Like the lack of medicines, like the lack of food. Medicines are a beauty. Some of the best medicines in the world were produced in this country. Take penicillin, we, we produced it. Yeah? Antibiotics were produced. All of these things that we actually produce. I'll tell you where I stand, shall I? We should take all the pharmaceutical industries into public ownership tomorrow. There wouldn't be any need to be importing anything. We should produce it here. There's no need to, not to. Did you know that there are hospitals in Britain where doctors are actually producing their own tablets? Even today. And the reason why they're doing it is because there isn't, there, isn't a, there isn't a shortage at all. It's the pharmaceutical industries who really do rule effectively. Why are they not giving away free pharmaceutical aid to the people in Africa who are dying yeah. and could be saved only for the want of a pill or an injection? And yet, we here talk about clause four of the Constitution. I remember speaking with Jeremy Corbyn when he argued that we would see the reintroduction of the means of production, distribution and exchange. Clause 4 of the Constitution. It's not in the speech he made the other night and it's not in the Labour Party manifesto because I've read it. Well, why isn't it? I want to see all the means of production, distribution and exchange owned and controlled by the people of Britain. In other words, take it into our own hands. Away from not only the Euro European Union, but from the rest of the world. Let's export it if they want it to parts of the world that desperately need it. And we could do it. How many people in this room know, for example, and I've got, I've got proof, I went into a shop, a supermarket, I needed some potatoes. I looked and I couldn't believe my eyes. Produced in Israel. Produced in Israel that are occupying land which belongs to the Palestinians and were imported. And it's stuck in there. And yet, there's no reason on earth why we can't produce all the potatoes that Europe wants, let alone ourselves. We've got varieties of apples that are, quite frankly, astonishing. We can grow practically anything. This slipped up the other night. I think it was on uh, Countrywide. They, they, they took you to a, a place where they've got two gigantic greenhouses. And they produce in these two greenhouses similar to the Netherlands, 10% of all the tomatoes that we need. Now, if my maths are right, if we had 10 greenhouses, <laughs> we could produce all the tomatoes we want. Well, this young lady who was with him, you know, because they are really sometimes charming. She said, innocently, she said, but uh, what happens, you know, when they die off? As, as they do. He said, they don't. He said, she said, how? Well, he said, we plant them at different times. He said, so we have 
you know, tomatoes in July, August, September, October, November, December, fine in December, no problem at all. She said, well, thank you very much, it's been very kind of off the went. In other words, there is no reason on earth why we can't produce our own goods. But we're now facing a crisis, as has been said by Eddie, by Alex, and by um, everybody tonight. What do we do? Well, the only thing we can do is to fight back. We're not going to fight back by just having a meeting like this, which is vitally important. We should be having meetings like this in every town, in every village that we can in Britain. Inviting people to listen to the truth. Listen to the alternative. And above all, yes, it is time to take to the streets and demand that this lot <coughs> implement the will of the people. They told us in 75, the will of the people has to be obeyed. They said in 19, 2016, whatever the outcome, every single party, whatever the outcome, we will respect it and implement it. What nonsense, what liars, because that's the only word that fits. And you've now got a coup going on inside the Labour Party leadership itself. I know these people, by the way. John MacDonald used to work for me in the NUM. And Kersley, I used to negotiate with him when he was chief executive in Sheffield. So I know who they are and what they are. But I'll tell you this, there's something fundamentally wrong with someone like John MacDonald, if it's true, who throughout the last, what, 30 years has voted against Britain's membership in the European Union, arguing now to remain inside the European Union. For me, that is a real betrayal. Yeah. And I can't honestly accept it, nor can I tolerate it. I salute people in Hartlepool for sending up, and they'll remember my debate with Mandelson about Clause 4. At the end of the debate, he didn't want to vote. But they had a vote, and it was 80% for Clause 4, and 20% against. But they didn't carry it out in the manifesto. In other words, it's only when you speak to people, you impart to people what the truth is, and how it can be reversed, that you will come to a conclusion that's in the interests of people. The people of Greece had an opportunity. They put forward a demand, quite simply. That was it. I'll tell you this, they didn't expect the result they got when the people rejected the position of the European Union. But when they did, they should have said, that's our position, and come out of the European Union and back into the world. Because quite frankly, there's only one way to deal with it. Don't play by their rules. Yeah. If you do that, yeah. you'll do nothing. I remember personally being told to play by their rules. In 1984, I was taken into a court and I was told we had to obey the appointment of a sequestrator and then obey the appointment of a receiver. What do we do? We say, get stuffed. In other words, as far as we're concerned, it was our members that should determine our policy, not some Supreme Court, not some House of Lords, not some High Court judge. I tell you what I said in 1985, and I did so to the whole day in society, the judges in this country should be the subject of election every five years. And if they're not doing a job, get them out. If it's good enough for us, it's good enough for them. And it's high time we had a democracy that reflected that. Tonight, we've had an opportunity to give an alternative. An alternative to a European Union that is destroying your very lives. If you want to fight back like I do, then join the campaign. Look at our literature, listen to our argument, listen to the points that we put forward. 
and do whatever is necessary to ensure that when we leave the European Union, we do so on our terms and not theirs. I'll tell you this, I wouldn't have been too worried if they'd have said, well, in the whole of Ireland we're re reunited. So what? It wouldn't really matter, would it? That wouldn't have satisfied them because they want the customs union and they want the single market. And of course, they also want the freedom of movement of capital and goods. And therefore, <coughs> those fundamental points, I will never agree. I've been a socialist ever since I was 15 years of age. I fought as hard as I could for those things that are fundamental. And this is the most fundamental thing in my life. Defeating the arguments of those who want to remain in an unelected body, dictating policy, economic, social and political. The sooner we're out, the better for every man, woman and child in Britain. Vote to come out, fight to come out and tell this lot in Parliament if they don't do it, they're out.